Hi everybody, Will Alexander here. This week on the interview chair we have dog show legend Michael Kemp. Great to see you, Michael. Sit back and enjoy Michael. Hi, everybody. On the interview chair today, we have the legend himself, Mr. Michael Camp. How are you, Michael? It's good to see you. I'm doing just fine, Will, and, and I'm glad to see you, too. Yeah, it's great to meet you. How's this? Uh, how's retirement? Are you retired now? Oh, yeah, I retired from the handling business at the end of 2016, and I'm retired from everything except uh, television watching now. <laughs> are you enjoying the playoffs? <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm. I told Nick a minute ago. I'm. I'm hockeyfied. <laughs> exactly. Oh, you've been great so far. So. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get started. I'm glad you joined us today. The first question is, um, how old were you, Michael? And when did you get started in the sport? Or how did you get started in the sport of dogs? Well, I think I think I was uh, probably in my late twenties. Uh, or mid twenties, possibly. I got started in sport of dogs uh, because I had my uh, wife at the time, and I had a uh, Weimar on her that needed to to be trained. And so, when I lived in Houston, the uh, uh, Houston Kennel Club had a uh, training session down to Sears parking lot, and uh, so people could go down there and uh, work their dogs uh, in obedience. So I, I found out about that, and we went down there. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Sounds like you had a dog there, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Nick's house. We uh, we met a woman down there named Adeline Pardo. She was a an obedience trainer and a, a handler. And so she suggested that I uh, uh, come to her training classes because she felt like I had a a good hand with dogs and uh, so I started going to her obedience classes and that's how it all started. I ended up uh, going to obedience trials and I traveled some with her and then I began to go by myself and I was pretty successful in obedience and then uh, after that I got brave and uh, I finished this Weimar Wyme on her dog in uh, the confirmation uh, classes and then got a, got a bitch and finished her too and uh, Met other other handlers uh, uh, besides Adeline that were pretty successful people, well known people, and and uh, one thing led to another, and then uh, after that, I uh, moved on to uh, another situation, and uh, I was at the uh, Galveston Kennel Club shows, and uh, uh, my wife says. Uh, looking over there to carry blue and she sees the dog and she was Irish and uh, uh, lo and behold, it was Rick to shoot in with uh, chances are. Wow. And uh, she says, what kind of dog is that? And I told her it was a uh, carry blue. She said, Oh, that's an Irish dog. Right. And I said, yeah, she said, we should get one of those. And I said, all right. So we looked in the paper and found an ad for puppies at a place, not too far from, right outside of Houston. So I ended up getting one. And uh, I didn't know, anything about trimming dogs obviously so I, I started going to the woman's house who uh, bred the litter of puppies and she began to help me with the trimming and it and i got to where i could trim him a little bit and uh, finished him and uh, used to take me forever and a day to, to trim a dog and i mean my goodness uh, it was quite a quite a job in the beginning and uh, so I, I got to where i could trim him pretty good and uh, to move on, uh, along with the story, I got good enough so that I won my be first best in show with this particular dog. Wow. And uh, so then I, during that time, I, as I said, I, I met uh, other handlers. And one of the the most significant people in my life at that time was Rick Tashudian. And he was really my primary mentor. And there were other mentors as well as uh, like uh, George Ward and the uh, Peter Green, but Rick was the one who really uh, helped me with the technical things and the 
you know, this and that about how to how to do the how to trim and other things. And uh, so uh, one thing led to another, and I started going to the shows, and lo and behold, I got a handler's license. And at that time, you could, uh, if you had a kennel, you could uh, you had to have a license, but you could be licensed for the dogs that you owned or uh, however else they did. I forgot now, but I didn't have my own kennel, so I was working out of a kennel right down the street from me, and uh, those people had Westies, so I got a license for Carrie Blues, Weimaraners, and Westies. Now, what year would that have been, Michael? Oh, that would have been now, by that time, that would have been, uh, let's see, in the early 50s, I think. Wow. I'm not sure. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And uh, so um, I started uh, with a handler's license with those breeds. And and every year when I'd go to Westminster, Mr. Brumby was there. And he was the, the person who who would uh, was in charge of, of the handler's licenses. And uh, he sort of uh, favored me a little bit uh, because he was very friendly, only that way, nothing else. And he's and he'd always ask, I'd ask him uh, about applying for more breeds, and he'd say, "Well, what do you have?" And I'd tell him. He said, "What do you want?" And I'd tell him that. And he said, "Well, you better ask for that because if you don't, you're not going to get them." So that mm-hmm. led to getting an all breed license in five years. And wow! And at that time, that was supposed to be an accomplishment to get them that quickly. So um, got all the breeds and moved on. Next thing you know, I had my own kennel, a big, nice, big kennel, and. And started getting business as a handler, and uh, and uh, so after that, let's see. Um, I began. To, oh, I met uh, Dick Bochamp, Bichon guy, and he uh, gave me a dog of his own to show, and that's how I got started in that breed. And uh, so I was over in Florida, and uh, a guy named Alan Shimo who was a fellow who had, had won best in show with a lot of different breeds of his own. And he had, and he had this, this, uh, Bichon dog and his, its name was, uh, uh, Tika's urban Einer. I forgot the prefix. And, uh, he won the breed that day over me from the uh, bread bike class. And, uh, I liked him a lot. So I talked to Alan into, this was in January at uh, the Florida circuit. And so I asked Alan if I could take him to the garden and, and he was, he said, yes, he's in there. So he gave me the dog. He said, but Michael, he said, do you think he can win the breed at Westminster? I said, yes, I do. So I took him and lo and behold, he won the breed. <laughs> and Alan was sitting up in some seats just above the ring. And I looked up at him and I said, pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> so the dog went on and, uh, I think the record at that time for best in shows was three, and he got 39. Wow. So I was right about him. And that sort of got me rolling with that breed. And then I uh, ended up, uh, I had a, a, a built a new kennel. And this was in the, uh, by that time, I think in the 70s, I think. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, might be wrong about the dates. And that, so I had two kennels, and I ended up selling the original one and just uh, stuck with the new one. It was in an affluent part of town and got good business that way. And and uh, so I had a little had an apron out in front of the kennel, and I was able to uh, uh, train people with their dogs. So I started having these classes where I would teach the people how to show the dogs. We didn't train dogs. The dogs had to be trained. And, uh, I, I mean, the people had to... Be, I mean, excuse me, the dogs had to be trained. The people was who I was training. So there was a lady there with uh, a Brussels Griffon that was really nice. And uh, um, I hope I can remember, remember his name. But uh, he, uh, they said, oh, she won't give a dog to a handler. No way. Well, it turns out that uh, this dog was, uh, ended up, uh, being a pretty dog on good dog, I think he won about, I don't know, 14 best in shows or something like that, which was a lot for that breed at the time. It's a lot for that breed now, yeah. actually. 
but uh, I spotted him in that class, and that's how I got rolling with that breed. And uh, so we had a uh, we had a lot of a lot of dogs, different kinds. And uh, during my uh, tenure as a as a handler, just to skip the uh, flow here just a little bit, I fortunate enough to have a lot of good dogs during my time, and uh, I uh, have won uh, best in show in all seven groups at least once. And uh, so we had we had good dogs, and I had the best assistant in the business in Scott Summer, and he, he made uh, things tick for me and uh, gave me a chance to not have to be right on top of all the details. He took care of that, and uh, we had we had good dogs uh, in all seven groups, and uh, uh, made it a lot of fun and made it profitable, and uh, it was worth going to the dog shows. And uh, so we. Uh, we got going with the terriers and uh, primarily terriers and toys and, and non-sporting with a few uh, working and herding dogs uh, sprinkled in. I had good uh, bearded collies from uh, Donna Herzig in, in Cleveland and uh, and a couple of other people as well and was fortunate enough to win, uh, I don't know, half a dozen or so, or uh, maybe more, uh, Best in shows with with beardies I had some really nice ones, and uh, so during that time, uh, oh, and, and uh, Mr. Uh, Forbes Gordon was a tartan kennel guy. He's he's passed away now, unfortunately, but he was my he was my Airedale client, and we bred all of his dogs in my kennel, and uh, he had some really nice ones. And uh, uh, there was a. Uh, uh, Peter, I mean, uh, uh, Clay had a, had a, an Airedale, and Rick had an Airedale, and Rick's uh, dog was a, was really a nice one and proper in every way, and and uh, Clay's dog was a little bit bigger, uh, sort of a dog, and uh, uh, so my wife and I were sitting at uh, the ringside at the Montgomery weekend watching uh, Airedales and. Uh, and uh, Mr. Gordon had uh, had this one uh, bitch that he formed out, if you will, to a uh, one of his employees in Louisiana. He was in the oil business, and uh, the guy was keeping it. But it was a beautiful area, but she was just too small to show. She wasn't much bigger than a Kerry Blue, and uh, but she was really a nice one. So I'm looking at these Airedales being shown, and I said to her, I said. Look at that dog that Clay has. I said, that's the dog we're going to breed that little bitch in Louisiana to. And it produced a Tartan's Oil Patch Star, a great Airedale bitch. I don't know if you ever remember her or not. But she, she wanted to breed at the garden, and she wanted to breed at Montgomery. And uh, she was a really good one. Um, we had, uh, I went over to England. Well, I, before that, um, Rick uh, got me a really good carry blue to, to upgrade my experience with that breed and uh, uh, did some winning with that one. And then I went over to England to, to look at a dog, uh, and his name was Duna Rees Roadrunner. And I brought him back, and Roadrunner was, was really a fine dog, and he did well for me as well. And then... Uh, <clears throat> was he a, I, I don't remember the dog. Was he a carry blue? Yeah, well, uh, yes, Carrie Blue, Duna Reason Roadrunner, excuse me. And uh, so, uh, hope I'm not missing anything here. <laughs> we uh, have lots of time, Michael. We can just keep circling back. I want to hear it yeah, all. Yeah, um, there was uh, a time. Oh, and Mr. Garden, uh, we, we wanted him to get interested in wires, too, but uh, he really didn't uh, care that much about it, but he. We had uh, this wire bitch in the kennel that was really nice, and she had a great pedigree, but she didn't like to be trimmed. She had a fit every time I tried to trim her, so I never did show her. And uh, so I decided to breed her to Peter's dog, Galsal Excellence, and that produced Lonesome Dove. Wow. And uh, so Mr. Gordon actually, his name is on her as breeder of record, but he actually wasn't a breeder. Uh, she was bred, excuse me, in my kennel, and uh, so I mean, before that though, I was uh, we were sitting at at, uh, 
at Westminster watching the, the groups, and I said, uh, boy, you know what? I said, I have got to get a dog that's good enough to win this show someday. And lo and behold, she was sitting in the kennel as a puppy. <laughs> and we didn't know it. And uh, so um, see how that, let me see if I can remember how that started. Oh, yeah. So I was at the, they had a show out, out right down the road from our kennel at a, at a farm and ranch club. Uh, and uh, so I had other dogs and, and uh, Lacey was uh, just an open bitch. And so I had uh, Scott Shore, I think. And, and uh, then went up to Dallas and Fort Worth. And, and uh, then there was another show that was uh, limited entry. And I think it was three or four shows. And she, she won every day except uh, one day we didn't get her entry in, I think, on that limited day. And she, but she didn't win the breed. She just got one of bitch every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so then we came home from that. And uh, um, let me think how it all began with her. Um, started showing her and things started really popping. And uh, first thing you know, she's winning a lot. And I'm at the at the Astro Hall shows. Oh, I sold her to a lady that I was showing Norfolk for. And uh, so she had the two dogs. And I'm at the Astro Hall shows. I'm showing her in a group. And I had met Sam Lawrence one time before, but I didn't, really didn't know him very well. And uh, so as I found out later, Marion and Sam were watching the groups. And Marion Lawrence says to Sam, she says, what are you looking at, Sam? He said, I'm watching Bill McFadden with this Carrie Blue. She says, well, you need to look at that wire fox Terry that Michael Kemp is showing. So he started looking at it. She said, Sam, I want that dog. She said, he said, okay, I'll get it for you. So uh, Sharon Newcomb, uh, who was a friend at the time and says, she so she she told she called me and told me what had transpired and said you need to call sam he, he wants to buy the dog she said now don't make the price uh too convenient he said if you make it too low he won't think much of the dog so just make a nice fair price in the upper level of numbers she, she said charge him some money for it otherwise he thinks it's a bum so and he never did uh lease dogs he bought them outright or he didn't show them they were his dogs, and he owned them outright. So he bought the dog, and we started showing her. And I think she won, uh, I don't know, something like uh, 85 best in shows or something, her first full year in the ring under under his ownership. Wow. Because he could get me where I needed to be and, uh, and you know, do the advertisement and the whole nine yards. And he was a very likable fella, too. He was a great sportsman as well. And uh, during that time, we had other dogs, too. Uh, uh, before that, I, I, I got to backtrack. I forgot that one of the most important dogs in my career. <laughs> I'll, get back, I'll get back to Lacey in a minute. I had Lonesome Dog. I mean, I had uh, 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 Puff and stuff. And, uh, I wouldn't uh, have let you forget her. I would have yeah. made you come back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what a great Bichon bitch she was. And... Um, she was the worst behaved dog at the dog show, but man, she was a show dog boy. And uh, she won the group at the garden twice. And she was a number three dog, all breeds two years in a row. And uh, which made her uh, the uh, top nine sporting dog, of course. And uh, they used to have the Quaker Oats Award. You remember that, I'm sure. And uh, she won that a couple of times. And, in fact, I was I had some good dogs. I was fortunate enough to win that award five times. Uh, uh, twice with uh, Michonne and three times with Terriers. And uh, um, Puff and Stuff was a, was a unique dog that made the most out of, out of her behavior. And at first... Uh, they didn't know how to take her because she was so unorthodox. I mean, she never stood still. She he put her on the table for the judge to examine her, and she'd stand there, and they'd look at her head, 
And then they go back to the rest of the dog, want to come back and look at her face again. And she'd pull her head away as if to say, oh, you've already seen that. That's enough. You only get once. <laughs> and she wouldn't always stand still on the table. Well, she was a mess. And uh, I, one of the first shows I showed her was at Chicago International. And uh, Frank Sabella was the judge. And uh, there was a lot of specials, of course. And he, he told me, he said, Michael, I can't stop looking at this bitch. He said, I got all these other dogs. He said, I can't stop looking at her. I said, well, just look at her at the end. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so she, she won. And uh, and uh, uh, what's his name? Well, the two fellows from Canada that used to judge it. One was a big guy, Bill. What's his name, Bill? Bill uh, Taylor and, and Nigel. Yeah, Bill Taylor. Yeah. Bill Taylor was doing the best in the show. And he gave it to George with the Scotty, which is all right. That's a great dog. Well, for sure. But he told me at the end, he said, Michael, boy, what a dog you got here. He said, that Scotty just stumbled one time you had this pal. So uh, anyway, she was she was quite a dog. And uh, we were sitting at a table one time. Uh, it was Peter's birthday, I think. And there was a, about there were several of us there, uh, clients, but uh, mostly. And the only handlers there were uh, Dougie Holloway and and uh, Peter and myself, and uh, we were talking about great dogs we'd all shown, and, and Dougie brought up toward the end of the conversation about, don't forget about Puff and stuff. She's one of the great dogs I ever saw, he said. <laughs> she, was, she was that. So uh, she won, one year she won the group at the garden, and I'm standing there waiting for the ribbon, and she had a knack of uh, shaking her head and getting out of the lead. She shook <laughs> her head right there in the middle of Westminster and went running around the ring looking for Scott. <laughs> Loose in the middle of Westminster. How did how did how did Puff come to, to how did you how did you get Puff? Oh, I forgot that story. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'm at home and the phone rings and it's Bochamp on the phone. He said, "There's a lady named Nancy Chaplin," and I said, "Oh yeah, I've heard of Nancy." He said, "She's a Bichon lady," and I said, "Yeah, I know." He said, uh, "Well, she's got this really really nice Bichon bitch," and she said, uh, "I mean," he said. I know you like to see them before you take them to show. But he said, she's going to call you about showing this bitch. He said, just say yes. <laughs> so I did. And that's how I got her. Wow. And uh, <laughs> off we went. <clears throat> and um, so while I was showing her, uh, let's see what happened next. Uh, that's when Lacey came along. And um, um, there she was in the kennel, a little puppy. And one thing led to another, and we took her to that show I told you about and started showing her, and Sam saw her, and he bought her, and off we went. The way we used to show her, one reason why she won so much, besides the fact she was a great dog, uh, I had uh, several uh, judges, I think, are qualified to make this statement, said she was probably the greatest show dog of all time. And... Uh, these were people that had been around for quite a while. One, Maxine Beam, for, for instance. And uh, she told me, she said, Michael, you know, I always loved Fear Not. And I said, well, Maxine, I said, I never got to see him. Uh, but I know he was a great dog. She said, uh, Lacey is in that same league. And she said, I believe she's better. She said, I believe she's the best show dog I've ever seen in my life. Wow. And, and then there was a couple of other ones that said the same thing. So, so there you go. And um, so the way we showed her was we tried not to show her to people that had already judged her. In fact, Sam and I would get on the phone before we made entries and figure out where we were going. Now, I didn't always go somewhere with just her. I went with the other dogs as well. But then it would get to a point where we we were looking at, at premium lists and it was some of the same people again. So I'd have to let Scott go with about 10 dogs and he and, and another boy. And I would go off with her because I, could, I didn't want to show the same people. So we tried our best to avoid showing her to the same people all the time. And that's how we won with her because they, they liked her and everybody wanted a chance at her. So that's what we did. Uh, she won... Uh, one year, she won uh, 85 best in shows under 65 different judges. And uh, that's the way we did it, and it's the way to do it if you can. 
Yeah. Because this business of running the same people all the time doesn't mean squat. <laughs> and uh, uh, she uh, became the uh, uh, second biggest, win no, second, third winningest dog of all time. And then Michael Scott tied her with his water dog. Uh, it's uh, Jimmy Shepherd. And uh, who's the second? Who's number two? I've forgotten now. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. She might be the second biggest winning dog of all time. Not possible. She's the second or third. And um, so uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say. I'll take either one of those, second or third. <laughs> I shouldn't know that, but it's slipping my mind at the moment. Uh, that's something you wouldn't think a guy would ever forget. Uh, so let's see, where are we now? We're at, I want to uh, know about the garden. I want to know how, how that transpired. That oh, day. yeah. Yes. That's a good story. So I'm up at, uh, on the New England circuit and Mel Downing as a judge. And, uh, oh, before that, though, I was at San Antonio and he was on the panel and I was showing Lacey and I'm coming out of the group and there he is standing with his hat in his hand, his coat over his arm. And I'm walking out and he says, hello, Mr. He says, hello, Michael, how are you? And I said, I'm fine, Mr. Downing, how are you? He says, you know, I haven't been able to do much for your dogs lately. And I said, yeah, I know that. I said, what's the matter? I said, uh, did I do something wrong? No. He said, you just didn't have anything that pleased me. He said, but you do now. He didn't judge her. He just saw her in the ring. So after that, I'm up at the, on the New England circuit, and he's doing the terrier group. So he gives her the group, and it's a very strong group. You know, it's Peter and all the terrier boys from the east, and everything's pretty competitive. And he tells me while I'm getting the picture, he says, you know, Michael, he said, this is a, one of the strongest terrier groups I've ever judged. And I said, thank you, sir. It means a lot. So I'll get the picture and off I go. And uh, so right after that, we see this, the uh, judging panel for Westminster. And Mr. Downing never sees her again. And I don't, he don't get near that bitch until February. <laughs> so several months went by before he ever judged her again. And that was at, at the garden. And Mike Billings was the terrier group judge, and she had never beaten her. <clears throat> and I tried not to show her a bitch any before that, but she was a substitute judge in a, in a San Antonio, I think it was, and I had to show her the bitch. She made a comment about it. I said, Mike, what am I supposed to do, not show her? I said, I didn't want to show her to you today. I'm not going to pull her from the group. And I said, it makes you dig a fuss. So she said, okay, that's good. So she gives her the group that day, but uh, other than that, I didn't show her the, her the dog either. So we get to the garden and uh, uh, it's really funny. So we're in line. Boy, she just showing her ass off. She's getting down to the end of it. And uh, he's coming down the line and I'm looking down at her and her little tail's just going. And I look down and her feet are a little bit farther underneath her than normal. Not a lot, but a little bit, and a li little bit wider apart than I thought they ought to be. But she's really on, and I said, I'm not touching her. Just leave her there. And he comes on the line, down the line, he's over my shoulder, and he looks down at her, and she fixes her feet just how they ought to be by herself. <laughs> and he, I look, cut a, a look up at him out of the corner of my eye, and he had a big grin on his face, and he passed on by and I said to her quietly, I said, baby, if you don't win this now, you ain't never going to win it. <laughs> so he put her up. Boy, and what a dog. You know, she just said, I got to fix this. I don't, I'm not right. So she fixed it. She's <laughs> the smartest dog I ever showed. You know, in fact, I did an interview one time in California for for ESPN or somebody like that. And, and they asked me a question. I just the answer to the question was I never uh, did any winning with a dumb dog. And, uh, you know, you win a lot more with the smart dogs. You know that. Okay. And, uh, yeah, you know, when you have to drag them around by the nose all the time, you ain't going to do a whole lot of winning. And uh, these dogs that lead you around, that's all I did with her is I just put a lead on her and followed her around the ring and made sure I didn't screw up. Yeah, they make us look good. Oh, man, I mean, you've had some of those. And uh makes it easy, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, for sure. So, um that was a deal on her with the garden. 
And um, the, the reason why I, I uh, took her back again for a second trip to the garden was because she'd only been out 18 months at the time. Oh, yeah. And most dogs, when the garden, it's, it's on the momentum that they built up during their career. And usually right. the best of show dog is, is, is at the tail end of his career. It always seems to work out that way. But having only been out for 18 months, Mr. Lawrence said, oh, we're going back again. Well, it wasn't the best thing for us because the group judge was Ruthie Cooper, and there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes about that. And so she ends up not giving her the group to give her third, I think. How, can, how you could do that, I do not know. I mean, you had to, you had to have a lot of pressure to, do this, to beat a dog like that and give it third. My Lord, I guess third would have been better than second, I guess. <laughs> uh, but that's the way that went. I had a really good chance for best, I think. Uh, I think it was uh, Mrs. Walton, I think, was doing the best in show, and she had put her up before, and uh, I was kind of licking my chops. But I knew I had the worst of it, so that's the way that went. But Sam wasn't going to back down. He says, we're not going to let him run us off. We'll just go and take our chances. Yep. So we did, and we didn't. <laughs> so there you go how many best did she end up with 216 wow and she did that in th in uh, three years which is another really nice feat because you know so, when no dog ever won that much just a couple of other breeds but uh usually when a dog uh, wins a great big number of, of best in shows there they show them for four or five years, and they keep showing them and showing them, showing them, trying to get to a certain number. Right. But she did this in a in a comfortable amount of uh, years, and just uh, you know, a normal uh, career, three years. In fact, it was a little bit less, teeny bit less than three years, and uh, we're done. And uh, Sam wanted to break George's record. <laughs> he, he wanted to make sure he did that. George was pretty hard on us. Oh, was it? Time because he didn't want anything anybody to break that Scotty's record. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> One time I was in Florida and I was just kind of taking a break. I was sitting on a something by some vendor's stand and and Rick comes by and he says, "Hey, how you doing, kid?" I said, "Doing fine." He says, "You know, George has been pretty hard on you lately." And I said, "Yeah, he has." He said, "Well, don't feel bad." He says, "He's been hard on everybody at least once in in a time." And he said, uh, "But he he's afraid you." Your bitch is going to break his, his bitch's record. I said, Rick, she's only got about 60 best in shows. He had 212, I think it was. And uh, he said, yeah, yeah but she's going to break that record. She says, I know it. George knows it, and you should know it. He said, there's no stopping that bitch. She's, she's one of the great show dogs ever. That's what Rick said. Wow. And uh, he made a statement one time. He said, that's the only dog that I've ever seen that every time she stops, her feet are exactly where they're supposed to be every time without any help. You know, just she walks to wherever she's going to go and stops and boom, there they are. And I attribute that to uh, her, the way she was built, you know, the way she was made. She, she couldn't stand any other way. It's impossible. And, and also her brain power. She's wonderful. So you'd mentioned that Rick was probably your main mentor. How did you meet Rick? Well, I, I met Rick uh, with the the Kerry Blue situation, yeah. and uh, uh, it was that. You was walk up and say hi. I'm Michael Kemp, or did he come to you? Or oh, uh, let me see how the heck that went. Oh, uh, jeez, uh, good question. <laughs> uh, I can't remember how it, how it actually started, but he just we just sort of. Hit it off, and uh, he just uh, he he liked me because he could see how much I I was trying and how hard I was working, and and he and he could see that I had talent, and he was always uh, admirable of anyone who really tried hard and did it the right way. Yep, I agree. And he we would be sitting uh, we were sitting one time out in California watching some of the judging, and he, he told me, he said, uh, let me tell you something, kid. He says, it takes talent to see what's good in a dog. So anybody can see what's wrong with them. He said, just remember that. 
So That's he true. used to say little things like that to me, and those kind of things that meant a lot. You don't hear that from everybody. No. And um, then I I met to somebody like Larry Downey. He used to call me Engelbert Humperdinck because he knew I was a singer. <laughs> <laughs> he called me Engelbert. I played a lot of golf with, with Clint Harris. He would come to Houston and we'd play at my club, and he and I always won money. We used to beat my friends. <laughs> Clint, Clint was a pretty good player, he, and he was he was a good putter, <laughs> and uh, so we used to do that. And George and I partnered up on the golf course a lot too. And uh, uh, what a guy's name, George, uh, the the boxer guy, George, uh, George Rude. Yeah, George Rude used to always piss him off because George and I would be partners, and he couldn't beat us. One time there was a hole. And I, I, it was a dog leg right, and I could hit the ball pretty far, and I, and I, so I teed it up and, and hit a, a big high draw over the corner of this dog leg, which put me down in the fairway beyond the the dog leg, and George and Rude just jumped up and down, pissing and moaning, and said the ball's out of bounds because it crossed over out of bounds while it was in the air. In the air. He didn't want to pay off the debts at the end of the day because I did that ball out of bounds. <laughs> That's how dumb that sucker was. Uh, what a guy. He was a great pool shooter, though. George yeah, Rude was a great swimmer, was the apparently. He was the best at shooting pool. Now, nobody could beat George at pool. Now, so, let's go back uh, to your – tell me uh, something about your yeah, singing I'm, career, Michael. I'm talking about all my old buddies now. <laughs> well, I'll tell you about the singing. Um, I, um, I don't, I'm trying to figure out where to start. When I was in high school – I had a I had a trio of fellas, uh, two fellas that performed with me. And we used to we used to do uh, uh, special performances in the auditorium uh, every now and then. And one guy, Jim Black, played guitar, and he was a great musician. And he also ended up playing uh, bass, I think. In uh, uh, I think can't think of the guy's name anyway. Uh, very well-known uh, musician had a band that played in New Orleans. Eventually, he ended up playing with that guy later on in his adult life. And then the other guy's name was George Berry, and he was the bass guy. And he he ended up playing with some well-known bands later too. But that's how my singing started. And uh, so then I um, uh, just started singing uh, a little bit here and a little bit there, just little little school dances and stuff like that. And uh, then uh, Kenny Rogers and I became friends, and, and we were still young. And uh, he had his brother's name was Leland, and Leland Rogers was Kenny's manager. And so he was, he was Kenny was show business, mm -hmm. and that's what he wanted to do. And I was all over the place. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. I didn't know anything about dogs at that time, and. Uh, I mean, I could have been a dog hunter. I could have been a singer. I could have been, well, I don't know what else. But those are the main two things. <laughs> and uh, could have been a mess, too. And uh, so uh, Kenny and I got to know each other, and we used to sit at, at his house, and we'd play uh, music together and, and all of that. And he went on because of his his brother and um uh, they had a they had a group. This is when this is when groups and uh, quartets and so forth were popular, and uh, so they they had an uh, had a uh, a contract to sing at a club in Austin, and they had this guy named Al Eisman, who was the lead singer. Kenny wasn't even the lead singer, and Al thought he was he was the nuts boy, and uh, he kind of got in the way and and uh, and wasn't very uh, very good for the situation and so they they had a two week option up there at this club and they didn't uh they didn't uh renew it because of this guy so they they hired me to be the lead singer now we didn't take that two week option but we sang other places and so I was the lead singer and this, so that's how, how Kenny became a backup singer for a while <laughs> <laughs> So uh, then I, I ended up having a little trio of my own. We were pretty good, but we didn't make a lot of noise. 
and uh, but we were good and uh, and then Kenny went on of course and and he moved to California and formed the first edition and he was very good and uh, uh, he was he, he was a great entertainer I mean he was showbiz all the way yeah and I sang at uh, some pretty important venues in Houston I sang at a place called the City Auditorium it's no longer there and I, there was a guy named Carl Perkins he was the original recorder of blue suede shoes yep, yep. I sang on a show with Carl and uh, uh, there was a guy named Tommy Sands it was uh, a high school friend of mine it was probably the best looking human being I ever saw this guy was so handsome it was ridiculous <laughs> and he he, uh, he ended up marrying Frank Sinatra's daughter and uh, he got he, I don't know what happened to him but he started messing around on her and Frank sent him to Hawaii to manage a, a a uh, car rental place. He's <laughs> like he didn't end up with concrete foot joys on somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, Tommy was uh, uh, going to be doing a show at in Houston at the Coliseum, and uh, me and my boys were going to sing on the show. So we showed up for rehearsal, and I hadn't seen Tommy in a long time. He was on stage uh, tuning up with the band. They were you know practicing rehearsing. And I walk in, and I hadn't seen him in a while. And he says, "Hey, Kemp!" He yells real loud. And uh, so we we had a, a big hug and so forth. Then we sang on the same show with Tommy. And he had already won a couple of uh, of uh, what I don't know is it Emmy of the award that they give on TV for for uh, performances and acting. Yeah, Emmys are acting. Yeah, he had made he had made a couple of movies and got had already won a couple of Emmys. Wow. So he was a big star. Oh, yeah, hey, Kemp. <laughs> and uh, so our little trio sang on the same show with Tommy. And then, uh, you know, one thing led to another. I sang uh, different places. No, you know, I never did pursue it, though, even though I was very good at it. Uh, we had a manager and uh, with the little uh, quartet I had, and she uh, had made contact with the manager of the Platters and sent, them a de- sent him a demo that we had made. And the guy wanted to sign us up. He wanted to take us on. And the three guys I was seeing with didn't want to go do it. They wanted to go to school. Oh, imagine that. (laughs) (laughs) There I was. Boom. No singing. So I never did really get into it like I could have. I think I could have done pretty well. And uh, but it just it wasn't in the plan. You know, God has a plan for everybody's life, and his plan for me was uh, being a dog handler, so I did. Yeah. Worked out pretty good. God, yeah, yeah. But it sounds like you've you've done a, almost everything, though, Michael. So what about um, advice for young handlers? Well, first thing I would say is, remember, it's all about the dogs. Try to keep the people out of it. Uh, people get uh, too hung up in... Uh, what people are saying about uh, this political situation, that political situation, who's doing who and what they're saying and all that stuff. And uh, they don't think they can win because of this and that and the other thing. It's all about the dogs. And Rick used to always tell me in the beginning, he said, look, kid, he said, you get the best dogs that you can and you make them look as good as you're capable of making them look and then you go. And that's what I did. I was fortunate to get my hands on some really good dogs, and I worked hard. I made them look as good as I could make them look. And by God, they won. Yeah, they sure did. And that's all there was to it. I wasn't a clever handler. I didn't talk to judges to set up wins and all that kind of stuff, which I know is done, unfortunately. Uh, It's not done all the time, but it, it happens. And I know that there were probably judges that favored me for whatever reason, but it wasn't because of a conversation we had. I mean, if you have good dogs and you do, and you work hard and you behave yourself, you're going to, you know, that's just uh, human nature. People are going to like you and say, there's that guy with a really nice dog, and boom, you win. But it wasn't because of something overt that happened. It just, that's human nature. It works that way. So the best thing I can say is keep the people out of it, Try to be friends with everyone as much as you can. Always learn to appreciate the other guy's dog. When you're in there and you don't win, 
take a look at that guy's dog and see see what made it good or, or see if you think it's good enough to win and be sure and take a good look at it. It's all about the dogs, yeah, no not question. the well. And so no, no judging aspirations at all for you, Mike? Well, I started off with that, and I was going to do it. And I got going, and then um, it just became apparent to me that it wasn't something that I really wanted to do. I thought I would. I thought uh, for sure I would. And I judged a, uh, a Bichon, uh, an, I forgot what, I don't know if it was a national uh, specialty. Or, it was a specialty in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, three, uh, three or four years ago, three years, I think. And uh, after it was over, it just didn't, didn't, uh, didn't excite me. You know, I, I realized that uh, it just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, it's very expensive. And I didn't see the need for me to spend a lot of my hard-earned money to be a dog judge, uh, make any sense, and go to go to uh, seminars and and uh, all that sort of thing to find out about breeds I already knew about, and spend my money to travel there and to to attend the, the seminar and all that stuff. That's ridiculous. But the main thing was it just didn't didn't. Uh, turned me on. I, I didn't, didn't get excited about it. So I decided, man, the hell with it. So what in do you fact, think? Oh. oh, excuse me, go ahead. No, go ahead, Michael. In fact, uh, the, I don't miss uh, going to dog shows at all. Uh, I like going to dog shows to see the people. I like watching the, the judging, but I don't miss the uh, the, the uh, being there as a, as a handler or being involved in any way whatsoever. I like the freedom of just going there, saying hi to people and just doing whatever I want to do. And uh, that that's that's what I do. I don't go very often. I go when I can drive to the show and turn around and drive back home. I don't I don't go and stay in motels and do all that. It's too it's too tiring. I'm getting old. So I just <laughs> I just I just go. There's a few shows around here that I can do that. And I did that last week and uh, uh, when that when the COVID uh, uh, restrictions are, are lifted once and for all. It'll be a little more free. It was a little, little uh, difficult to enjoy it. There, you couldn't sit here. You couldn't sit there. You had to do this. You had to do that. And yeah. you know, I said, "Man, this is not much fun." So, so I'm looking forward to when that's over with. And uh, there's a couple of shows uh, nearby in July. They're five minutes from my house. I'll be going to those. And then we got Canfield coming up after that. I'll be going to those. But I can go back and forth to those. So. So that's where I go. What were you going to ask me, Will? What, what have you been doing with yourself? Oh, well, as you know, I'm completely retired, and uh, I uh, I'm watch a lot of hockey, Will. <laughs> <laughs> me, too, hockey. Michael. me too, Michael. Me too. Yeah, so I'll be, I'm gonna, I know you have. I'm going to watch uh, hockey and the PGA Golf Championship this weekend. Wow. I think we got, we got hockey tonight. I'll be watching that. And... Uh, Thank, thank God for C, CSNBC and oh NBA. What is it? NBCSN and C. What's the other one? CSN? No. No. Yeah, ESPN. Um, no. And CB. Didn't NBC has still has the hockey rights? Yeah, there's there right another now. off channel that they had uh, games on. So I got two channels carrying the games, and I'm 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 hockeyfied. <laughs> yeah, I know you are. We, we've spoken about hockey a lot. Yeah, you, yeah. Well, my Penguins won last night, but I think they're in a little bit of trouble, Will, because uh, if they go uh, glove hand, shoulder high, he's a dead duck, my my oh, goalie. Tristan I think the guy's retarded. He can't. He, he goes up with his elbow, but he can't raise his glove up at the same time. <laughs> he's not the number one goalie. The other guy's injured, I think. Yeah, well, this is he. He was highly touted last year, that Tristan Jari. So you yeah, know, right. Yeah, lots to talk about him. Yeah. yeah, boy, that man, that that flurry is on fire, isn't he? Oh my gosh, yeah, he is something else. No stopping him. As long as he stays in the pipes, don't get out too far. <laughs> uh, I used to always scream at him when he was with the Penguins. Get in the pipes! <laughs> <laughs> I have one last question for you, Michael. All right, shoot. 
If you could go back and talk to the 20 year old Michael Kemp was, would, be, would, the, would there be any advice you'd give him? I can't think of any, Will. I, I, I really, honest to goodness, That's good. Uh, I'm sure there were things along the way that I, I could have done better, but I don't think I made any glaring mistakes that cost me. That had I not done that, it would have been better. Uh, everybody makes mistakes of some kind. Yeah, oh, no uh, But I was very fortunate to do what Rick told me to do. And I was, you know, God gave me a great eye for dogs. When a good dog walked in front of me, I didn't miss it. And uh, I remember one time uh, Rick was sh showing uh, Red Baron, and he had he had sired a litter of puppies, and Rick was wondering where the heck those puppies were. And we were out in California, and, and the guy was bringing one of the puppies to the show for Rick to look at. And it walked right past Joe Waterman's setup. They were outside. And uh, the guy stopped, and Joe said, I'll look at it after a while. Right on by him. And uh, Rick found out about that, and he said, yeah, that's Joe. <laughs> you know, if he'd, if he'd have really jumped on it, though, he might have gotten it. Who knows? Yeah. And it turned out to be a pretty nice puppy. And, uh, but anyway, the thing is, is that... Uh, I learned I learned a lot of important. I knew Rick was always so busy. When I was out in California or at the shows, he always had about 30, 40 dogs, and, and he never had time to say, do this, do that. But when I was around him at shows, he always allowed me to be there, and I could watch and, and learn. And I didn't know how to pull a hair on a wire fox terrier, but I just learned watching his girls in the trimming room in California a little bit. And I bought my first wire from Rick, and I finished it in three shows. And uh, right after that, on the Texas circuit uh, in Galveston, and George was there, and he never came down there, but he came that, that year. And we walked in the ring, and Rick and George both had champions, and I won the breed, and I beat both of them. Wow. <laughs> With that dog I, I bought from Rick. Yeah. That was the first wire I ever showed. So I had a knack for trimming. There you go. Jeez. It's one of those things, you know, who, who knows? Who knew? <laughs> so it's, it's an art, and as long as you have that art, you were an artist being a singer and whatnot in your life, it's, it's, it just tends to transfer, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I never I never looked back. I never thought, oh, man, I, what if I'd have been put my heart and soul into singing? That's a lot. You, you think dog shows are competitive. That business is really competitive. Yeah. That's a business where it's who you know. If you know the right people, you got a shot. If if you don't, they can they can turn it back on you in a heartbeat. And uh, but uh, you know they can't keep you down in the dog business if you're good. Well, we're you glad you stayed in the dog business, Michael. What's that? We're glad you stayed in the dog business. Well, I'm glad I did too. <laughs> <laughs> Made a lot of friends, Will. That's for sure. That's that's a huge family. Well, thanks, Mike. I really appreciate your time. It was great to see you. I hope we can catch up at some point, and maybe we'll yeah. talk after the playoffs, see how our two two teams ended up. So. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Thanks, Will. I really appreciate the time you gave me. All right, Michael. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Michael. It's great to see you. If you like what we're doing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. Don't forget, if you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. Or if you want to find out what's happening in Will's world, go to willalexander.net. Don't forget about our podcast on Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple, The Dog Show Drive with Wayne Cavanaugh and myself.